So why did Bibi fail to form a coalition? Neither Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu nor his far-right former Defense Minister Avgidor Lieberman blinking in their showdown over whether ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, should uh, uh, do their military service. Is this the Jewish state's new political divide between secularists and the religious? With the left fading from re relevancy, we'll ask if this becomes the new hot-button issue when Israelis do it all over again in September. Netanyahu made sure of that when he cut off at the pass any chance of another party having a crack at forming the next government. The stakes in an unprecedented second snap election on the trot in Israel are personal for the prime minister. He's seeking immunity from several corruption probes. Can the Teflon PM dodge this bullet? We talked about the new hot button issue. The old one, well, that's peace with the Palestinians. And I guess call it a sign of the times, but it's pretty easy this Thursday to overlook the visit of Donald Trump's son-in-law and Mideast peace envoy, uh, Jared Kushner. We'll nonetheless put Kushner's visit in context and ask uh, what is high on Israelis' minds. Today in the France 24 debate, Israel votes again. Joining us from Jerusalem, Rachel Broida, who is, was with the Likud campaign in April. I suspect you'll be uh, on the trail for September. We'll have, we'll have to see. All right. Welcome to the show. I want to welcome from Jerusalem Hagai Matar, me. executive director of 972 Magazine. Thank you for being with us. Hello. Uh, film director Gil, uh, also joining us is Gil Mahaley, editor-in-chief of Causeur uh, Magazine, columnist for Yediot Aronaut. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. And John Linden, uh, Europe uh, Director uh, for the Alliance for Middle East Peace, the advocacy group. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. The uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. The deadline passed, neither side budged, and the blame game began. It's just unbelievable, just unbelievable. A Victor Lieberman is now part of the left. You give him votes for the right, and he doesn't give his vote to the right-wing government. This is what we see. Gosh, uh, calling uh, somebody left-wing, calling Avgidor Lieberman left-wing, that's... That, that, that's what do you make of that remark by by the campaign just began yeah this what uh, this was the light motive of the uh, Likud's campaign everyone who's not with us is a leftist um, <clears throat> I think the most interesting <laughs> reaction to this current situation was Yair Lapid who's number two in the um, the, 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 the centrist the, blue and white coalition he said for all those who were disappointed by the last chapter of Game of Thrones there you go <laughs> yeah, so we are headed for for uh, for, for for it again. And it, what would you say, Rachel Broy, is the is the mood are uh, going into uh, another election campaign? I think a lot of people are frustrated. Um, I'm going to be honest. I think I think a lot of people who voted for a, a Victor Lieberman expected him to support a right wing government. This is now not the first or the second or the third time that a Victor Lieberman has toppled a right-wing government. And I think that a lot of people on, I would say, the traditional right are fed up with that. And I don't think it had anything to do with the draft law. And I think it was very much like a personal vendetta against the prime minister. And I think we'll just have to see how the campaign progresses. Hagai Matar, do you, do you agree that it's not about the draft law for all ultra-Orthodox Jews? It most likely isn't. I think there's a cynical interpretation, which is that um, Lieberman assesses that Netanyahu becomes the next prime minister. He will pass all the personal laws that will make sure that he gets to reign for four more years, and then another four, and maybe then another four. Whereas if he cuts this at but if he stops Netanyahu from becoming prime minister now, maybe he can make his own push for power. Um, that's the cynical interpretation. Another one would be that he is actually building an uh, um, anti-religious center. That's a much wider issue than just the draft law. So the draft law itself is not the question. 
we, we seem to be having a little bit of uh, trouble with the audio. Apologies for that, Haggai Matar. We might, we'll try to fix that and, and, and get back to you, uh, to you right away. Uh, Avgidor Lieberman, he got slightly more, by the way, that 4% of the vote, yet the way uh, Israeli politics works, the uh, Soviet-born former nightclub bouncer is a kingmaker. He looms large. Luke Schrego has more. Hawkish, ultra-nationalist, Avigdor Lieberman is an outlier in Israeli politics and no stranger to brinksmanship. If Likud votes on dissolving the Knesset, we will support it. No one should doubt that. We won't support any alternative candidate to form a government. The son of Moldovan emigres from the Soviet Union, Lieberman got his start in politics, rising through the right-wing Likud party's ranks ultimately heading up Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office before he formed his own party, Yisrael Beitenu, in 1999. Lieberman took a hardline agenda on security and towards the country's Arab minority and Palestinians, calling for Gaza to be, quote, flattened into a football field and for Israel to bomb Egypt's Aswan Dam in response to its support for Yasser Arafat. Despite criticism, Lieberman became increasingly popular over time. It made him a key player in a nation where coalition politics is the norm, with Netanyahu ultimately drawing him into government several times. He served as foreign minister between 2009 and 2015, though briefly had to step down between mandates to deal with corruption charges of which he was ultimately acquitted, and then headed up the defense ministry for two years from 2016. However, Lieberman has always stuck to his principles rather than deal-making and compromise, and left government after a ceasefire went into effect in Gaza in 2018. It shows he's not afraid to break with his right-wing ideological bloc, particularly when it comes down to his secular ideals too. Lieberman has for some time sought policy to end exemptions for ultra-Orthodox Jews serving in the Israeli military. We want to form a government in which it would be clear that there would be no compromise in the Haredi draft law, not a comma or full stop in it. It's not something we hide. The very nature of Israeli politics means coalitions are often fragile. Lieberman's presence in one often drags its politics further to the right, and outside one, he brings considerable sway to the Knesset's opposition. Sandlin, what does Avgidor Lieberman represent? Um, he represents many things. He's a security hawk. I mean, if you're going to sum him up in a very sort of pithy phrase, it'd be that he doesn't like Arabs and he doesn't like Haredim. And if you look at his uh, actions over the last couple of years, there have actually been consistent with that and that he's left governments, at least ostensibly, over security policy in Gaza and over the conscription of Haredi or, or ultra-Orthodox uh, yeshiva students. So in that sense, he represents his base, which is a secular, very secular, Russian emigre, security, hawkish uh, voter share. But that bloc, that former Soviet uh, emigrant bloc, is shrinking as a part of the Israeli electorate. So there was a huge immigration in the early 90s, but we found that as those voters get older and their children enter the electorate, they basically replicate normal sort of um, uh, Israeli-born citizens, regardless of their background. So Lieberman knows... So not all Russian emigres vote for Lieberman. No, no, absolutely not. But a, a large proportion do. And he's managed to maintain a sort of a system of patronage and, and very much is seen as a leader for the community. But he knows that long term, he would have to position himself as being a national leader for a larger constituency of voters if he's to, to break out of that sort of prism of being seen as a sectoral politician rather than a national one. I think that explains some of his action. He's made a bet that in the post-BB era, we're probably going to be coming to at some point soon, um, being seen to be strong and to make this statement on ultra-Orthodox conscription. And don't forget, Yair Lapid won 19 seats with this being his main agenda item in 2013. There's voters there. So doing so on this issue lets him stake a claim and potentially build a new base for, for the year to come. Do you agree with that, Gil Mihaly? Absolutely. What we are seeing here is the eruption of the hidden agenda. The hidden agenda is, of course, uh, <clears throat> Bibi Netanyahu's problems with the, with the law. Uh, almost everyone estimates that <clears throat> he will not survive uh, 2019. And but then why did they agree to go into coalition talks if, uh, if Ooh, the others it, feel uncomfortable? Lieberman? Uh, yeah. Uh, Lieberman played the game. Uh, he just uh, he made um, he, uh, his position. He, he he probably didn't want to negotiate. Uh, the idea was who will take the fall. Uh, 
what Netanyahu said uh, in his first uh, public appearance after the, uh, after the vote, uh, he said that uh, uh, Lieberman is a leftist and that it's his fault. This is the game now. Uh, Lieberman will try to convince uh, the non-religious right and an anti-religious center that he is a man of principles and that he can uh, be the next leader of, of the Israeli right and the next prime minister. And will he succeed, uh, as John was hinting, of, of in, in his attempt to poach votes from that centrist coalition? I don't know, but I think that the strategy is intelligent. I think it could work. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will work, but I think it's one of the only ways he could play. And if you, if you were to rank what is the issue, is it that, the, this issue of secularist versus religious, or is it, as we said, Benjamin Netanyahu the issue? It's the post-Netanyahu era. This is the only thing. Why is it the post-Netanyahu era? After all, he was set for a fifth mandate. Why is his time over? Because uh, Netanyahu could have uh, at least two or three different governments. Uh, he was locked in the 65 uh, deputies option because he asked of them to vote a law that will give him immunity, which is paradoxically called in Israel the French law. Because in France, uh, uh, an acting uh, uh, president cannot be uh, held accountable before the, the law, as long as he's in, 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 uh, in office. He wants the same treatment. And uh, this is why he didn't have an alternative uh, coalition. And this is why he paid dearly for the 60 members of Knesset, the, 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 the religious got a lot of posts and money and, uh, and, lo and legislation. And, and Lieberman understood that this is his weakness. This is his weakness. This is why he cannot really threat with a national unity government with the generals. They would have gone with him if he would have... The generals were supporting blue and white, the centuries. Exactly. He could have had a government of 80 without the ultra-religious. He but they wouldn't have, have gone along with the amnesty bill. No. Right. So everyone saw that uh, uh, Bibi is bleeding, and th this is his weakness. And Lieberman was the first shark to attack and to bite. All right. Let, we can call up the graph that shows uh, what that potential coalition uh, would have looked like after the April uh, vote. And there you see it. If you add them up, those are the votes of the right and the ultra-Orthodox parties that get to those 65 seats that Gil was mentioning. Uh, add the religious parties together, 12% uh, of the vote. Uh, the, uh, the party, 4.14 there, that's, that, that's um, uh, Avgidor uh, Lieberman, and that gets you to 49%. Rachel Brody, as you, as you listen to Gil Mahaley speak, do you wish that there'd been a grand coalition reaching out to either uh, the uh, or both of the centrists and the Labour Party? So, um, as we have seen there, all of the parties communicate. It's not that there was no, um, it's, not, it's not that nobody tried to form an alternative coalition. Um, I think that when you, when you speak to people that were involved in the negotiations, it became very clear that a Victor Lieberman had ridiculous expectations. He, up for a party of uh, five seats, he requested five, uh, five cases or ministries. It's something that's unheard of. And I think that, you know, blue, blue and white made their position clear, which is that they would be very happy to sit with Likud um, had the prime minister not been the head of Likud only demonstrating that they're just this anti-BB party in it. It's not about any platform or any policy. It's just this, we hate one person and we're going to keep going on that. Well, they would on, argue that it's, that that it's about path. the prime minister think, facing justice. So, look, Israeli law is very clear that the prime minister does not need to resign until all of the appeals have been executed. The, that law has been in place in Israel since basically the founding of the state. It was designed that way on purpose. Um, and I think that a lot of the people that are claiming this sense of justice and whatever are ignoring the law and ignoring a very big part of justice. People are entitled uh, to have their cases heard in court. This is not a court of public opinion. And the cases are not so clear. And the prime minister isn't, is entitled to the presumption of innocence. 
So looking forward, Haggai Matar, what's this campaign going to be about? Well, obviously, Netanyahu is in a fight for his life. Um, now, as, as you were saying before, there are sharks all around. Everybody understands his weakness. Everyone understands that there's not much of a chance that he will continue being the prime minister. However, the very first polls coming out this evening in the different television channels here show that the next uh, Knesset will look very much like the one that was just voted in. We're looking at minor changes a few seats here and there to the different parties. But basically, things are going to look very much the same, uh, which can make sense if we have two sets of elections set apart by about two, uh, four or five months, people don't change their minds. And it looks like the, the next Knesset will look the same. All right. So if uh, they do it all over the again, only, very brief. That I, just, that just, I just think a... is worth noting. Sure. Go is, ahead. Yeah. Is that it's not it's also a question of which of the smaller parties will or will not run again. Mm. And, you know, if uh, the new right doesn't run or Fagelin's party doesn't run, that can drastically shift um, the dynamics of, of the results. So yeah, I think it of, is important to note that there are smaller parties that haven't said that they're going to run again. All right, a lot of time between now and September 17th. When we come and back, we're going to take a look at how this impacts again. more broadly Israel going forward and how Israel is changing. Stay with us. It's the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and uh, we're looking at an unprecedented prospect of an, uh, an Israeli prime minister unable to form a coalition and f uh, uh, the return of uh, voters to the polls. It'll be September the 17th. We're talking about it with uh, Rachel Broyd, uh, Likud campaigner, who joins us uh, from Jerusalem, from uh, Tel Aviv, Haggai Matar, executive director of uh, 972 uh, Magazine. Uh, we're also uh, joined uh, by uh, Gil Mahaley, editor-in-chief of uh, Causeur Magazine, and uh, John Linden, the Europe director of the Alliance uh, for a Middle East uh, Peace. We were talking uh, before the break uh, about uh, the divide over whether or not the ultra-Orthodox uh, should serve in the military. They're a growing force. One recent survey by Israel, the Israel Democracy Institute puts their birth rate at 6.9 children per woman. More from Yen Ali. It's an Israeli institution. Most women and men are obliged to serve in the Israeli Defense Force for two to three years. Israel's founding father, David Ben-Gurion, created an exception for ultra-Orthodox Jews known as the Haredim, leaving them to study sacred texts. At the time, the rule applied to around 500 yeshiva students. Fast forward almost seven decades, and the Haredi population topped one million people, representing some 12 percent of Israelis. In September 2017, Israel's high court declared the exemption unlawful, ordering the government to make new legislation. The demand, though, is easier said than done. Israel's various political parties don't see eye to eye on if, when and how many Haredim should enter the army. The country's proportional representative system has also seen the rise of ultra-Orthodox politicians. They're lobbying for greater rights to preserve their way of living, and many are already playing kingmaker in legislative elections. But it's not just enlistment that's on their minds. Ultra-Orthodox leaders have been pushing to close and boycott businesses that operate on the Sabbath. Some rabbis even prone the use of DNA tests to verify the Jewishness of new migrants coming from the former Soviet Union. Once on the fringes of Israeli society, their influence is expanding. Haredim are a growing minority. According to Israel's statistics office, ultra-Orthodox Jews could represent one-third of the country's population by 2065. Well, for more, we can cross now to filmmaker Amos Gitai, who joins us from Charleston in the United States. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Pleasure. Uh, your, your latest film, A Tramway in Jerusalem, 20 years ago, uh, you uh, pre presented at the Cannes Film Festival uh, Kadosh about uh, two women in the uh, Haradim community. What's changed in those 20 years? Uh, there is a resurgence of the impact of uh, ultra-Orthodox on the Israeli politics. 
And in a way, it's a division from the original project of Israel, which, as you may know, was a secular project. Actually, the ultra-Orthodox were hostile to the project of creating a Jewish state. They thought that we have to wait for the uh, rebirth of the Messiah. And so the original project of contemporary modern Israel, which was created more than 100 years ago, uh, when my grandparents immigrated uh, 1905 to Palestine, uh, was a project of creating a modern Jewish state, secular, a separation of church and state, of religion and state. This has not happened. Ben-Gurion already, when the state was created, did kind of a big uh, uh, remis, big kind of a gesture towards the ultra-Orthodox and allowed them to have a separate education system, uh, separate financing for the institution. They have been grown because these communities obviously produce a lot of children. So we are in a new reality in which they take more and more power and they influence the entire political spectrum. And unfortunately, the last, the most recent Israeli governments made major concessions and they erode the secular uh, nature of Israel society, also erode the, the power of the juridical system, change the education, make it more nationalistic and religion. And these are long-term hazards which this regime is creating. So this is, we're going to see how this will develop with the new elections. And, and Avigdor Lieberman, uh, for you, is he an unlikely champion of secular values? He's grabbed the limelight this Thursday. I mean, he said this morning something that I'm surprised that nobody from the left dared to say, but finally somebody said that the cult of personality of Mr. Netanyahu is reaching a kind of a, a spectacular uh, dimensions, and Israel should preserve some sort of democratic structure. This was, uh, we could not have predicted that this, would, this text will come from Lebanon, but somebody had to say it, you know. Israel should re conserve uh, open society, democratic society, uh, respect the minorities, non-racist attitudes, and this has been uh, menaced by the last uh, Israeli government. So, so let's let's hope and see. You know, it's, we are into unpredictable. Uh, maybe too too much. All right. Many thanks uh, for joining us. Amos Gitai for joining us from Charleston in, in South Carolina. Uh, Rachel Broid, uh, has Benjamin Netanyahu steered Israel away from its original values, away from the separation of state and religion? Um, so the answer is no, in short. Uh, Israel has no uh, formal separation of church and state. The chief rabbinate was established by Ben-Gurion's government um, based off of the Turkish and the British system. There has always been a very strong religious component. Um, I agree with Amos that uh, in recent years it has become more, I would say, ultra-Orthodox. Um, but there's there was no there was no goal of a separation of church and state that was never formally written anywhere. It's not discussed in the Declaration of Independence. There is no basic law ensuring a separation of church and state. And I think that it's just revisionist history to pretend that that was the original goal. The people who came up with the original marital laws in Israel were the left. It was the, it was Ben Gurion's party. It was not the ultra orthodox right wing parties in 1948. It just wasn't. Um, and I think that Israel is at a crossword where they need to balance between the minorities, uh, the, um, the religious minorities, the secular minorities, different groups. Um, Israel is facing, I would say, an internal conflict in terms of how they want to balance each group's needs. But I don't, I, I just don't buy into that argument that everything that's wrong with Israel is because of the ultra-Orthodox. Um, I think that the ultra-Orthodox well, hold on, hold on a sec. That's not the, that's not the claim here, Rachel. Uh, just there, there are these issues, though, that come up more and more. Uh, w there was a Pew survey done in 2016 that shows that 62% uh, mm -hmm. of the pop population overall favors democratic principles over religious law. And there's growing pressure, though, on issues like shutting down I, I public totally, services totally on the Sabbath, gender segregation on public buses. Uh, there is this so there, growing pressure the on Supreme these issues. Court has ruled, the Supreme Court has ruled time and time again that there's no 
uh, that no gender separation on any public buses is allowed. The ultra-Orthodox parties never endorsed it. Um, it was individual people choosing to behave inappropriately. Um, and again, the original structure of religion and state of Israel was established by the left. It was established by Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion was the prime minister who gave the ultra-Orthodox uh, the initial exemption from serving in the army, the marital construct, um, uh, the structure of a chief rabbinate at all was something that was established very early in Israel. And I agree with you that there is a debate in Israel regarding public transportation on the Sabbath, but that is not a new debate. There was never public transportation in the Sabbath. There was a compromise that dates way, way, way back to regarding Haifa. Um, but there was no, there, there was never any formal separation of, of religion and state. There has been no actual legal change here. There has been policy structures regarding um, supermarkets that want to be open on the Sabbath, regarding um, certain private education. Um, the ultra-Orthodox want to take part in a college education, but they want to do it privately uh, where they can learn um, in their social construct that they need. And the alternative is, uh, is not, as I see it, just, okay, well, it's either they'll learn separately or they will go to university. They won't. They won't go to university. Mm. Israel has an interest in having the ultra-Orthodox take part in the economy. And not everything is about, is about force. Things, you know, I, I learned a long time ago that uh, evolution is much better than revolution. And if we want to have a serious conversation about the Haredi community and how we are going to incorporate them into the workforce, into the education system, into the army, so we need to have a conversation, but it can't just come from a place of, which I've seen numerous times in the left, of that the ultra-Orthodox are backwards. All right, we, 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 still, that, we, still have, we, um, we still have with us Amos Kitai. Uh, Amos, your thoughts? I mean, I love the fact that your previous speaker speaks about evolution, because as you know, the ultra-Orthodox of all religion oppose the idea of evolution. For them, it's God, God made. And that's what is being told in religious it's schools. An and inaccurate, it's the, an inaccurate the, understanding, excuse but that's okay. I, I was listening very long to your lecture, so please be patient. So, and, and also, uh, I, I am happy that she's uh, accusing everything on the left, which is not in power for the last 25 years with small intervals. It's a bit like the system of Trump, that everything wrong in America is, uh, is the problem of Obama. You know? so, so let's stop these tactics. I mean, the, the erosion of democratic institutions, of racist speeches in schools, of the city of Afula, who swear not to have Arabs, of many phenomena, and our prime minister doesn't even uh, put his voice to protect minority, which is really uh, for a Jewish state, you should expect to protect minorities. This has been under the Likud regime. So let's not uh, tell us all sort of nonsense. The fact of, uh, like you mentioned, excluding women from buses and nobody opens his mouth because it's bad for the creation of a coalition which is supposed to defend uh, Mr. Netanyahu not to be accused of certain crimes. So all of that, I think it's, it's a risk to the future of Israel, it's an open society. And obviously, if Israel will stop to be an open society, it will confirm so some of the bad regimes of this region, and it will erode its capacity even to survive. So I think that the usual, uh, you know, uh, Netanyahu yesterday accused Lieberman from all people of being a leftist. For them, like a leftist is a sticker you put on the head of somebody you are leftist, and that delegitimizes what you have to do as criticism. All right, let, let, let me go let, back to your subject. Let, let to me go back to your subject. Yeah, religion has been ga ga gaining power and, and getting power, limiting the rights of women in the army, in the civil society, anywhere you go. And this has been happening under the Likud government, so let's not tell us a uh, boob case, like the same Yiddish. Let, let, me, let me turn to Gil Mahaley here for a second. As the, uh, you're the editor-in-chief of Kozel magazine, and these issues of... Uh, Identity, the place of religion, are things you address all the time here in France. What do you make of the argument we're hearing in Israel right now? <clears throat> Israel is, um, is not only a democracy, it belongs to the family of liberal democracies. And <clears throat> it's obvious that uh, it is always, it's still a democracy. The majority anyway, the rules, but it's the, the, uh, the, the liberal pillar of this regime is weakening. And uh, the religious parties are among the forces that are weakening uh, this pillar. Um, 
Is that irreversible? However, Sorry, is it that, is. no, it's not irreversible. It could get worse, but it could also get better. And this is the next argument I want to make, that when you look more closely at the um, orthodox or ultra-orthodox uh, society in Israel, first of all, <clears throat> it's not monolithic. There are many, many different groups, and there are contradictory uh, um, uh, processes. For example, um, uh, they were very obedient to the rabbis in the 50s and 60s, and now they all have their own political opinion, and they are all of the right. So the, 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 the rabbis have less and less uh, power of extortion in a coalition government because they don't have an alternative. This is one. First, second thing, the women. In, in ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox society, because men don't work, women work, they control the purse. And so there's, there are, there are, there's a, a very profound, almost anthropological uh, uh, um, emancipation process in this. Uh, if, and, and the last thing, if you take just mathematical demography, there should have been 50% of, of Israel today. So among the seven kids per family, not all seven became ultra-Orthodox uh, adults. So uh, it's very, very complicated. Uh, those of them who do so military service, those of them who uh, join the workforce, are establishing a different, they are, they are, they are diluting uh, this, this society and anything can happen. And just one remark, because it's very important. It has to do with the previous, previous debate. The question whether or not prime, a prime, an indicted prime minister can hold, hold office uh, is open. The, 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 the law doesn't say anything about it. But someone else said something about it. And it was Netanyahu in 2009. When Olmert uh, when was in his shoes today. Ehud Olmert, his predecessor. And, and, and Netanyahu was very clear. It's impossible. A prime, minister, a prime minister cannot order uh, an aerial attack on Syria in the morning and they go, then go to court in the afternoon to defend himself against corruption. John Linden. Just on the ultra-Orthodox point, and this is kind of contradicting slightly the sort of bifurcation, the separation between the security and sort of Israeli-Palestinian aspect and then the, the secular religious part, because we're seeing a trend, particularly amongst young ultra-Orthodox uh, citizens of Israel, where they are moving demonstrably towards the right. Many of them, as Gil says, are, are peeling off religiously and actually joining strands of Orthodox Judaism that are associated with some of the far-right parties. And even does there's, there's been sort of uh, new innovations with regards to parties over the last four years. Yachad that ran in the the 2015 election, for example, that drew a lot of votes from young ultra-Orthodox voters, but had a quasi kahanist um, uh, sort of very, very extreme agenda. And if you look at the numbers, because so many more young ultra-Orthodox voters are entering the electorate every year, if they begin to take on some of the security and Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, opinions that are more similar to the national religious community, you could see a much larger block opposed to any concessions in the West Bank. I mean, the biggest settlement in the West Bank is is an ultra-Orthodox settlement. And uh, going forward with the deal of the century, risking embarrassment in an election year in the US. So I think the deal of the century is very much off. For the Israeli public here, um, basically the Palestinian issue is no longer an issue. Netanyahu has been very successful in persuading Israelis that we don't need peace and we don't need to make concessions in order to save lives. We don't need them for international legitimacy. And Donald Trump has proved him right that we actually don't need peace for legitimacy. And therefore, Netanyahu basically supports maintaining the status quo, uh, entrenching the occupation much further. And there's no other party, almost no other party in the Israeli political system to challenge that. The main opposition party, Blue and White, did not really offer a new beautiful vision for peace. They don't support a Palestinian state. They don't offer an alternative. So actually, the Palestinian issue is very much off the table in the previous and the next Israeli elections. Haggai, the, the, the campaign leading up to the April vote was acrimonious. What's it going to be like this summer in Israel? Um, I think we're going to see a lot of incitement. I think the, the term left has become kind of um, uh, synonymous to, to traitors, to, to enemies of the state. Uh, it's been an ongoing process where Netanyahu and his political circles have been attacking the legitimacy of Palestinian political representation. And then after that, of anyone that supports 
the Palestinian cause in any way or supports peace or support, supports equality. Uh, I think Netanyahu saying yesterday that Lieberman is a leftist is basically kind of a dog whistle of saying Lieberman is the enemy. Lieberman is an enemy of the state. Lieberman is an enemy of the Jewish people. That's basically the message. So we'll be seeing a lot more of that. And right now, uh, could we have surprises between now and September? Or is it going to be the same as before, Gilmaley? Of course we can have surprises. Because every time it's we have an election, early. we say, oh, yeah, this is the last one for Netanyahu. And then on election night, what happens? Shimon Peres used to say that the fact that the, the, when a statement, in, a statement in Israel dies, there are a huge number of people attending the funeral because everyone wants to make sure himself that he's dead. <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, bury uh, Netanyahu. And for the Palestinian issue, for him, it's a gift because uh, Netanyahu and, uh, and uh, Trump would like uh, to keep the deal of the century as a promise. As long as it's a promise, as you don't know what's in it, you can, you know, hope and argue. It will be disappointed as soon as it will be revealed. So now there's a, there's a wonderful reason not to talk about it until December and maybe, as they say, because we are entering an electoral year in, 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 in the United States, uh, a couple of years, a couple of years uh, from now. Uh, on the other hand, and, and this is very important, uh, these four months that Netanyahu is going to lose are very important for his, uh, for his uh, uh, judicial problems because his hearing is scheduled for October and the, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the procureur, how do you say that? Uh, the state prosecutor. The state prosecutor said that, that October is the last date. So that's which going means, to be, that's going to be that hanging even over if the campaign. If, mm. Even if Netanyahu wins in, uh, on, in September, which is quite likely, he uh, won't have time to push he, through. He his will his. be already entangled in, 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 a, in a complicated we're gonna, situation. We're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we're run out of time. But I want to thank you, Gil Mahaley. I want to thank as well uh, John Linton, uh, Rachel Brody for being with us uh, from Jerusalem, Hagar Matai in Tel Aviv. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Queen. Hi, Francois. Uh, I'll start with one uh, video that went quite viral in the last uh, 24 hours, a, a scene from the Knesset uh, where the co-leader of the largest Israeli Arab party sort of trolled Netanyahu, of course, is uh, in the middle of a massive political crisis right now. So you have uh, Ayman Ode um, starting off very seriously uh, about discussions he'd had uh, with, uh, uh, with um, Netanyahu, uh, but you, you kind of quickly realise that it wasn't serious. Maybe we'll come back to the start of the clip and play it again. So <laughs> So what is, he, what is he saying there? All right, well, essentially, he's, he's proposing a sort of miracle solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where he'd had a discussion with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to sort of all of the major issues that have kind of been at the heart of this conflict for the last how many decades were suddenly kind of going to be resolved, which is obviously not going to happen anyway. Uh, so that was one uh, uh, video that went uh, quite viral. He in drew last... laughs from across the aisle. Itself. That's right. I think everyone just kind of, it was the delivery. It was the deadpan delivery. I think people were like, obviously, this discussion never happened. Uh, in any case, uh, just a couple of uh, analysis pieces. Uh, this from Haaretz. Uh, even Netanyahu knows it's over. This is Yossi uh, Werther writing here. And uh, he says, who will sign a coalition agreement with somebody on his political deathbed? And what, they're just, what he means by that is by the time uh, the next uh, coalition would be formed on the 17th of September, uh, Netanyahu is highly likely to already uh, have, uh, you know, been sunk by various corruption scandals uh, due to uh, in, in front of the Supreme Court and whatnot in, mm. in, in August. This is insanity. Italy, Italy at its worst. <laughs> politician entangled up to his neck in crimes with a harsh indictment hanging over his head, uh, dragging an, an entire country to the polls and no one in his party and no one in his planned coalition putting a, a foot down to say stop. So uh, that's kind of the tone and tenor of some of the analysis. The not very, a, the not very Netanyahu friendly. It, yeah, it's generally. a bit of wishful thinking, perhaps. Again, we don't want to write <laughs> him off too soon. Perhaps. Uh, another piece uh, from Haaretz, uh, Kushner's awful timing. So this is uh, uh, Donald Trump's son-in-law and advisor uh, arriving in in the midst of this political crisis. 
Uh, this is an analysis piece also in uh, Haaretz. And following the declaration of a new uh, election, Netanyahu, uh, which Netanyahu wrote off as a little event, the first person to bring up the fate of, of the Kushner's Middle East peace plan was the veteran Palestinian negotiator Saab Erekat, they write in this piece. And uh, he stated that the plan known as the Middle East a uh, deal of the century was now becoming the Middle East deal of the next century. In other words, booted 100 years century. down the track okay, yeah. and uh, highly, highly unlikely to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, see, uh, to see the light of day. So I think that's, that's certainly uh, one of the pieces of analysis coming through as well, that, uh, that the Trump peace plan is now um, very uh, unlikely to, to go forward. This is just one final piece on that in The Guardian. Uh, the, uh, Yehuda Shaul, the writer of this piece, he was an Israeli Defence Forces commander uh, during the Second Intifada. He's a founding member of uh, Breaking the Silence, which is an organisation of Israeli uh, veterans uh, working to bring about an end to the occupation. And essentially here he's saying nothing short of ending legal discrimination will make a difference to Israel uh, and Palestine and that uh, the peace deal can't. And that was written about a week before uh, the current political crisis. Mm. So only compounded by that. Mm. James Creedon, many thanks. Thanks for so much. I want to thank our panel again. Mm.